Well, hi, everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, I had so much fun last week with the lunar eclipse, I decided to go ahead and do the solar eclipse today, and we'll have a couple of more episodes after this one. Let's cue up the music and learn about solar eclipses. Now, just to go over the basics of what a solar eclipse is, the moon passes between the sun and the earth, casting a shadow upon the earth. Now, like a lunar eclipse, a solar eclipse can only occur at either the ascending or the descending node of the moon's orbit around the Earth. And those are the areas where the moon's orbit intersects and passes through the ecliptic plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Now, for example, in this area, the moon's orbit is above the ecliptic plane. As it comes down and passes through the ecliptic plane, that's called the descending node. And down on the other side, there is an ascending node as the moon's orbit comes up through the ecliptic plane. Now for a solar eclipse to occur, the moon has got to be at the node between the earth and the sun. So in other words, the sun would have to be up here. This is the exact opposite of a lunar eclipse where the moon has to be down at the other node with the earth between it and the sun. Now, if you ever wondered why they called the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun the ecliptic, it's because it's responsible for eclipses. In other words, the moon has got to be located on the ecliptic in order for an eclipse to occur. And also, just as the lunar eclipse would correspond to a full moon, a solar eclipse corresponds to a new moon. Now, while the moon's period of rotation around the Earth is 27.3 days, it is 29 and a half days between phases of the moon. That's because the 27.3 days is what we call the sidereal month. Now, the synoptic, or lunar month, is actually 29 and a half days because in addition to coming all the way around to where it was originally in 27.3 days, the Earth has moved along in its orbit and the sun is no longer directly above that spot. It's actually off to the side a little bit, and the moon needs to orbit another day and a half or so to line up with the sun. That's why new moon to new moon is every 29 and a half days. This is very analogous to the difference between solar noon, where the sun is directly overhead, versus the rotational speed and period of the Earth. The rotational period of the Earth is 23 hours, 56 minutes, and four seconds. The difference between that and the noon to noon time is that the Earth needs to rotate a little bit more to line up with the sun so the sun is directly overhead. The same thing is occurring with the moon in its orbit. And as a result of this interaction between the orbital speed of the moon around the Earth and the lunar month from phase to phase, and the need to be lined up with a node in order to have an eclipse limits the number of eclipses to a minimum of two and a maximum of five or six per year. That's when everything just lines up perfectly. In other words, on Earth somewhere, there will be a minimum of two solar eclipses and a maximum of five. As a result, there are two eclipse seasons per year. One, as we go through the ascending node in January, and the other, as we go through the descending node around July. That accounts for the two required solar eclipses per year. The reason there may be up to five depends on how closely the moon lines up with that node and for how long. It can take a little time to go from the beginning of the node through the node and exit the node on the other end and we may be able to get another eclipse or two out of that. Now, unlike a lunar eclipse, which is present from anywhere on Earth at night, the solar eclipse, is, at least the totality of the solar eclipse, is restricted to a very small area. This is, again, not to scale. But as the moon comes between the sun and the Earth, we have an umbra and we have a penumbra. And you can see the mechanics of that from this geometric drawing. But as a result, the point of the umbra that actually strikes the surface of the Earth is only about six miles wide. So the area of totality is only where the umbra strikes the Earth. The penumbra 
on either side is a partial eclipse. The areas that are not covered by the penumbra or the umbra do not see the eclipse at all. And unlike a lunar eclipse, which can demonstrate totality of eclipse for up to 107 minutes, a total solar eclipse will at most last only six minutes at a specific location on the Earth. But that path does trace a path across continents. Now, like a lunar eclipse, there are several different types of solar eclipses. For example, even though this is a series of a single solar eclipse, there are several examples that we can draw on. These solar disks here are only partially obstructed by the moon. This would be an example of a partial solar eclipse. In a partial solar eclipse, you don't have center-on-center -center alignment between the sun and the moon. The moon passes a little to the side of the center of the sun, and as a result, the sun is incompletely covered. Now, in the center here, we have an example of a total solar eclipse, where the entire sun is covered by the moon. Now, while this is an example of a total solar eclipse, it is a special category of total solar eclipse called an annular eclipse. Now, the reason that an annular eclipse occurs is due to the uh, eccentric orbit of the moon. The moon's orbit has a perigee when the moon is closest to the Earth and an apogee, which is when the moon is farthest away from the Earth. At the mean distance for the orbit of the moon, the moon is approximately 31 arc seconds in angular size, which is pretty much identical to what the sun is. But as the moon moves further away from the Earth, its angular size decreases a little bit. And as a result, you see the moon in the center of the sun, and then you see a rim of sun around it. With perigee, it would be as if the moon was a little bit larger because its angular size is a little larger as it's closer, and it will cover up the entire disk of the sun. Now let's talk about a couple of specific types of solar eclipses. With a partial solar eclipse, until approximately 90% of the sun is covered by the moon, you're not going to really notice an appreciable reduction in the light levels on Earth. When you get up to about 99% coverage, it will darken to the point of approximately twilight. When you have a complete solar eclipse, it does visibly darken, and in fact, it actually cools a little bit on the surface of the Earth because of the lack of sunlight coming in. Now, there's one other type of a special solar eclipse, which is exceedingly rare, but does happen. It has to do with the moon being in the sweet spot to just barely cover the disk of the sun at the middle portion of the path of totality. On either side of that, the slightly different distance between the surface of the Earth and the moon results in an annular eclipse, and that's called a hybrid eclipse. That's because it's a hybrid between a total solar eclipse and an annular solar eclipse at the beginning and the end of the path. Now, simply for completeness, the moon is not the only object that can cause a solar eclipse. If you are elsewhere in space, other bodies can cause a solar eclipse as well. For example, in 2006, the probe Cassini recorded a solar eclipse caused by Saturn moving between the sun and the probe. Now, in addition to the eccentricities of the lunar orbit, the Earth also has an apogee and a perigee in its orbit around the sun. The Earth is farthest from the sun in July, and as a result, the relative angular size of the sun is the smallest in July, and that tends towards total solar eclipses. The Earth is closest to the sun in January, and the angular size of the sun will be a little bit larger, and that tends towards annular solar eclipses. Now, there are two interesting phenomena that can be seen during a total solar eclipse. The first is what's called Bailey's beads, and these are these little pockets of light that are seen on the rim of the moon as it passes in front of the sun. 
This is sunlight passing through valleys between mountains on the surface of the moon. The second is called the signet or the diamond ring effect, where you see the sun starting to come out from behind the moon with a corona looking like the remainder of the ring. You can also see some Bailey's beads located in these areas, especially right there. Now the last thing that I want to address is the path of the solar eclipse. This was the August 2017 solar eclipse. And I watched it from Carbondale, Illinois, right here. Now in April of 2024, there's going to be another solar eclipse, which surprisingly will cross right here in Carbondale, Illinois. If the aliens show up, that's where they're going to come. And that's where I'm going to be watching the eclipse from in 2024. So maybe I'll get to meet ET. Now, one thing that has confused a lot of people is how is it that this path of totality moves from the west to the east if the earth is rotating from the west to the east? Well, the answer to that is pretty simple. If you look at the distance to the sun as 385 times the distance from the earth to the moon, you can actually go to a triangle calculator and figure out how far the moon moves in its orbit from west to east, you can figure out how fast the moon's shadow will move across the Earth and in what direction. So I did a little quick map. The orbit of the moon is approximately 2,400,000 kilometers, and it makes that orbit every 27.3 days. That means every hour the moon moves approximately 3,690 kilometers along its orbit. Now with the sun being very distant, the shadow will move across the surface of the earth from west to east at approximately 3,900 to 4,000 kilometers per hour. Now the earth itself also rotates from west to east at approximately 1,600 kilometers per hour at the equator. Obviously the shadow is moving from west to east faster than the earth is moving from west to east. And as a result, the shadow of the moon moves from west to east at approximately 2,000 kilometers per hour as it crosses the surface of the Earth. So I hope that cleared up a few things about the solar eclipse. Now we're going to move into something that's very interesting, and that is that there are cycles to both solar and lunar eclipses. And we're going to be talking about the Soros cycle and other cycles in our next episode. In the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by and visiting with me for a little while during this period of quarantine. So make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there. And I'll see you again soon with solar cycles, lunar cycles, and eclipse cycles. Take care, guys.